they want to put them in the um, chat and or we'll do hands up to to come in and do them at the end as well. There we go. So Sarah's recording now as well. Over to yourself, Darren. Brilliant. Thank you all. Um, so, yeah, this is a, a, a comparison really between the sort of types of inspections and types of assets between what um, what I saw when we were doing some work in New York and versus what we see in the UK. So starting off with New York, um, um, our main sort of purpose there was to look at the reliability of switches, track and also other signaling equipment. Um, so I'm going to run through sort of types of assets and how the infrastructure is um is also made up so um the construction types we have so 40 percent of the track is is on elevated structures so that's sort of like 10 meters above uh the street so you've got uh, uh roads and vehicles running underneath so that introduces another set of hazards when inspecting um 35 percent is in the subsurface it's mainly a cut and fill construction with steel columns, um, concrete track form with timber ties or sleepers and, and blocks as well in some cases. Uh, we've got 25% in ballasted open sections, um, mainly timber uh, ties or, or sleepers, um, but there are some concrete there as well. Um, and there's also some sub sort of ballasted subsurface sites as well. There's 2,200 mainline switches and over 722 route miles. Rail section is, is predominantly 115 RE, ARIMA rail section. There's also an older version of the 100 um, RE rail section as well, and it's heat treated. Just a little bit on the, the elevated sections. Um, so the sleepers or the ties, they're directly mounted to the girders uh, and they're extended to mount the walkways on. Um, uh, they're also braced to attain the track alignment um, and cant is achieved by increasing the depth of the tie so we don't actually cant the tie or elevate the tie at one end it's it's a flat tie but it has, is a slightly thickened um sleeper on one side to, to get the cant um all track is jointed on the elevated sections um started construction around 1912 um as part of this sort of uh, development of new york and spreading out to the boroughs so that's that's when it mainly started um, and there's some pictures there on the right hand side. That's, that's me inspecting a set of switches at um, one of the sort of problem sites we kept um, having. Give you a little bit of a, a background to this sort of a, uh, anatomy of the um, of the switches. Um, top left, so they call the, the, the switch tip the point tip. Then there's a switch foot, which is like a sort of an articulated. Um, joint that, that goes on to what we would call a lock stretcher. But in this, this terms, it's called a signal rod. Um, bottom left there, now, most of the SNC is actually uses a heel joint, or it's a loose heel joint. Um, we used to have these sort of, I guess, pre-Victorian era when, when we used to have um, loose heel switches. They still have them. Um, they have sort of fixed heel, fixed joints at the back and loose, loose, loose bolts at the front. So it gives some articulation through the joint. So, these are a known reliability issue, but they are they're still in existence and still still causing lots of problems. And then track rods, that's what we would call a stretcher rod, throw bars, um, and then there's other lock rods and so on there. The sole plate is called an S plate. And that thing on the right hand side is a big plate called the house top, which I'll quickly go through as well. So the house top, so the house top sort of is used to reduce wear and also to provide some um, mitigation against derailment in terms of, sort of flange climbs, flange climb derailment. Um, so it works in both both routes, um, face in 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 the turnout and in the normal route and facing and trailing. Um, and the idea is to guard the uh, the switch through, so you have direct guarding or you know protection for a, similar to a check rail. And these these drawings. Uh, show um, switch on the bottom bottom left hand corner there you've got the switch rail closed and then when it opens it goes underneath the housetop so quite a few failure modes of those lots of them um, uh, tend to be the housetop starting to tilt or moving downwards and then the switch starts to jam underneath the housetop so that's quite a common one and believe it or not, just for a bit of history, we did actually install a house top on London Underground back in 2015 at Piccadilly Circus. I was the project engineer for that, and, and we did a lot of development with AEA at the time and developing some sort of new outlock, the wider tightening, wider flangeways, gauge widening, all sorts of things. And, and you can see there we've got 
cameras that were looking at these wheel rail um, inter interaction interfacing. Um, and that was for all movements. So the housetop is, is there passively in some areas, and passively in others, depending on, on the route and the direction to be taken. Um, so type three construction uh, examples there um, and some type two um, LV construction. So that's your Sonneville blocks, um, low vibration Sonneville blocks um, that we used in quite a lot of the uh, areas where they were flushed out by Hurricane Sandy in 2012. So there's a large track construction project for that and also 9-11 uh, and the 9-11 collapse and a lot of work around 9-11 area. They did a lot of track construction improvements there, so they used a lot of LV blocks as part of that. All of our works was looking at signal failures. So we, we mapped all the failures. We're looking at different types of switches. Um, so frozen switches in terms of being iced up, uh, circuit controllers, and then the adjustable adjustability of the locking, detection systems and so on out of adjustment or, or other things, uh, dry, dry slides, which we know is common in the UK as well. Um, then there's other things to do with pneumatic point machines, uh, tight heel, so looking at that heel arrangement that I showed you, because that can cause can cause um, reliability issues where we have a tight heel. And then there's some other sort of specific stuff, uh, broken bolts and switch hardware and so on. But out of them, what we did do is um, we actually were able to link these to track condition faults. So some of these were signal faults on their own, but what we were trying to do is actually link them to the track condition fault that was causing the problem. And it was really bringing signals and track together to make sure that we, we understand why the failure is happening and, and what particular track works are needed to be done to, um, to stop the failure from occurring again. So we, we looked at the different foundation support types for the different track construction types um, from type one ballasted through to the low vibration and timber support, steel support and elevated support sections. And then we thought we came up with the the, um, the main concerns or known concerns with regards to how switch failures occur in those areas. Um, so we were able to then do we did a, a root cause analysis, looking at um, the sites, looking at the failure data, um, looking at the track construction types, the designs, um, uh, looking at the point machines themselves as well, and all the loading and connections, and then coming up with um, what we thought was the, was the main sort of root cause. Um, just a few photos here of some of the sort of typical conditions. So left hand side, I think that's the Bronx, um, shows you where there's elevated cant there, and they've actually um, added on a section to to produce that sort of uh, to produce the can isn't good practice we don't really do that because that of course means the rail is not in correct plane um, and you can see it's braced on there but in some cases the uh, it's very difficult to get in and to break up you know those panels without actually doing a uh, four renewal some of the tie conditions down the bottom right hand there so you can see some rotten ties now interesting you see these little baskets on the bottom right they're actually there to stop and catch bolts that fall off. <laughs> so this is an IRJ um, there. So there's bolts in the IRJ. If they were to break, then this cap catches the bolts before they fall down onto the, the road below hitting cars or pedestrians. So lots of what they call baskets all around the section there. Uh, top right is, is a set layout that they were building in Brownsville, which is their fabrication depot. So we're involved in some of that as well. Typical examples, my typical example. So um, lots of rods and bolt clearance issues. So here you can see uh, a switch. A it's a, a switch reinforcing bolt that's snagging on a switch stop. So as that snags and stops it from closing, we're going to get some issues with with switch reliability and detection. So um, there seems to be lots of bolts and, and protruding things from the switches that were causing these issues. Um, Top left shows you the bracing arrangement they have within the stock rail. So there's some adjustment there. There's, in fact, there's, there's quite a lot of adjustment, which means you can go very far out of design or out of design datum. Um, and then you start to lose your gauge, you start to lose your, your switch fit. And before you know it, you've, you've lost where you're designing. So important sort of to, to retain that. So the having that amount of adjustment is, is probably not, not a good thing. Um, Aramay, I don't I think, think you want to just... 
just pop your camera off, mate. It's just to film, just coming through a little bit robot-y. Yeah, not a problem. Let me just go no up to there. Okay, is that better? It's not the moment, but hopefully we'll do in a sec. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just go back to represent. Yeah, it's better now. Thanks, mate. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no lag, is there, Ian? Not now. We're okay. Is the lag okay? Yeah. Good, 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 good. Right. Um, yes. Yeah, so bottom left-hand side as well. Lots of obstructions from track rods against uh, bearers. Um, again, due to the design, due to um, the lack of room for, for a lot of the objects there. So a lot of failures were caused by that. This is the heel joint. So a left, the left-hand one shows a very wide heel joint. Obviously, that's going to create quite a lot of impact loading, lots of bolts being broken and, and other things tied to void. So voided heel joints from wide gaps was a problem and broken bolts. And then on the right hand side is a tight heel joint. So you've, you haven't got the articulation there. It's tightened up. So there's also a, a, a summarization, winterization issue they have with a lot of their designs where expansion isn't being managed in certain cases. So we have to look at that for the SSC as well. Water ingress, another issue. Um, basically, most of the subway is is the sewer for the roads above, and lots of rainwater comes straight through the drains and into the subways. Most in most areas, it's, it's controlled and pulled away from the track, but in some, it's it's actually open and does come onto the track. So, um, lots of issues there with with flooded switches and, and lots of pumping um, formation as well. So from some of the other track conditions we're looking at, so avoiding the structures, the hill joint issues, poor vertical alignment, we're seeing the poor face up, which is um, when the switch it meets up against the stock rail um, and track obstructions. So these were the main issues we were seeing. Um, so a description of the sort of condition we were seeing and then also looking at how the signal may be, how the signal equipment may be affected from that. Um, a lot of it was down to vibration, um, some high pressure contacts within point machines due to the makeup of the point machine as well. Um, switch machines facing up, creating a sort of high slide plate friction as well for poor vertical alignment. Um, their design was very prone to, I'd say, high friction on switches. Um, a lot of old grease and contaminated grease over the years that had just been piled up on top of each other. Movable switch. Um, poor face up, so there was no real standard for for switch face up or what I call residual switch opening. So we sort of introduced some some standards and some some guidance on that, so that we can get better reliability in, in the point systems as well. And water ingress, you get the, the track pumping, ties rotting, uh, the debris build up and obstructing as well, and then also water ingressing into point machines into the circuit controller boxes and, and the airlines as well. So rusting of the airlines was quite quite a common one. We provided some switch reliability training. Um, so really we're looking at the common failure modes, um, inspection, considering the reliability condition rather than safety uh, or as well as safety. Um, so techniques for reliability inspections, where to look, how to look, um, what techniques to apply. Uh, we gave them an explanation of wheel rail interface and interactions in switches to, to show them where problems can be caused. Um, we also introduced some step gauges because they had no method of measuring the gaps that we need to measure in SNC. Um, helped them determine the root cause. Um, and the reliability inspection we developed also tracks the work. So it actually the work that was undertaken to correct the fault. Um, acts as a sort of causal analysis system as well so we can close out the work or you can loop back in um, so that's really yeah that's the the sort of four stage process for the form was review the failure history and we had some good access to failure history a lot of it was annotated and free text so we had to do a lot of um you know uh searching and finding for certain words and so on um, and we apply this sort of measured and visual inspection um, for reliability. Look at we, with the observations and then create these sort of possible root causes. And then we recommend what we think is the sort of immediate or long term actions to to um, to 
um, eliminate the problem. So this is a uh, some of you may 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 recognise this from the Grey Rig report, but we 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 used some of this um, some of the diagrams from there to explain um, flange back contact and how that might occur in their switches and in their crossings and and in their housetops. So you know. Making them making them aware, you know, some of the issues we could see with the the PoE, the track rods, the stretcher bars, and so on, where we get um, forces that transmit back to the switch machine, and they're getting a, a lot of forces and, and vibration forces also feed back into their circuit controllers that in some cases are are independent of the point machine. So there's another failure there that can occur as well. Uh, we developed a. Uh, switch system context diagram so we broke down all the parts of their switch system um, from the machine down to the ground fixings the rods and so on um, then we looked at it from the track supply side um, so we've got the slide plates the fastenings the ties the track rods so that's the that's the track um, assets then we looked at geometry so within the switch panel geometry uh, the face up, the lengths, the curvatures, the track gauges, the flangeways, and the openings, and so on. Um, and looked at these sort of line side equipment and so on. So that's sort of internal system for the switch panel, switch panel system. And then we looked at the external influences and how they affect it. Um, so this really sort of helps to understand, you know, um, the consist of all, all the internal and the external influences. Um, it's used quite a lot in CSM. Um, RA work. Um, we use it in network rail and some some actions. We used it in Intertrack two as well to understand interactions. So um, it, it helps us sort of uh, establish the connections between the two and and how whether it's a functional connection or whether it's an operational. So you can sort of be, you can also draw down into requirements from that as well. And this, if you look at the externals, we've got the sort of human interfaces, the vehicles, the track, operational maintenance environment and all the other interfacing areas as well. Um, and it's, use, it's useful for sort of attributing failure modes as well, um, sort of functional and safety requirements as well from sort of those specific connections that you have. So we had a lot of issues with high friction due to either obstruction or dry slides. Um, quite a lot of work and looking at um, uh, current draws um, so here, this is where one of the examples where we applied some interflow and lubrication before and after um, to show where we improved the um, or reduced the current draw. Um, only drawback with 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 uh, New York was that there is such a buildup of old um, contaminated grease, so it's removing that contaminated grease in the first instance, and then what you realise is the switch is, has been hogged by the grease because it's been packed over the years. So, so that's another issue we have to sort of contend with. We introduced some, some um, gauges. So these are basic step gauges that we currently have on network rail. We have to do some imperial versions for, for, for New York so they can measure certain switch gaps and, and, and slide share gaps. And on the left hand side, this is an example of their JSI, which is their joint switch and frog inspection form. So they actually have an inspection where signals do the top part and track do the bottom part. Now you'd think it being a joint switch inspection that there's some good collaboration there, but unfortunately that line still does divide the two. In some cases, signal do their inspection part without the track there and vice versa. So it's not really a joint inspection as such, um, and the two don't really talk, which is sad really. And this, so we're trying to improve that, making sure they do align they do discuss the, the 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 problems they're seeing from both sides and make sure that they do together, you know, um, solve the problem. And we also had to do, introduce some summarization checks um, for SSC because it was prone to fail um, in the summer, where we have we had sort of rails expanding, joints moving, and other parts of the POE starting to fail as well. So, so we started to look at summarization checklists as well. So for the current draw, they didn't have a remote condition monitoring on their system, so we used a, a Fluke 123B, which we connected to the um, relay fuses in the in the control rooms, um, and then we were able to, as the throw, points were throwing, we were able to do a, a current draw from that. So it's a mobile RC, um, 
uh, condition monitoring device really we could use. Um, it's no notable that each switch machine had its own sort of clutch setting, so we had to understand the current drawers as well when that came through. Um, this is just a, a a brief description of 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 the the cycle um, that we got from the current draw. So you see the initial in rush of current, which should be around the ampage of the clutch setting. So around sort of 13 to 14 amps. Any higher than that, then we know we've got a problem um, because the clutch is is overcompensating and, and there's issues elsewhere. Then you have the unlocking phase, the start to drive phase, uh, uh, and then the, the locking up on the opposite side. Um, uh, and that's where we start to look at and dissect that. One of the problems we saw, so this is one at World Trade Center, you can see the trace there, quite erratic. It draws up, it's pulling a very large current, and then it comes to a, a section where it starts to stutter. And that stuttering um, wavy line is really a rapid deviation in, in sort of uh, where the switch is rubbing, uh, well, either on the slide, shape, slide chairs or something else is rubbing. And the picture on the right shows it was actually rubbing on the bearers, the um, the front switch rod and the lock rods were, were rubbing as well. So this is all evident from remote modern monitoring, if you could see that and you know there's a problem. But bearing in mind that as the switch moves through through different temperatures and stuff, these things become apparent through, you know, for different switch movements. Also did some air pressure monitoring as well. Um, so we monitored um, you, some of the air, air machines. Um, I looked at the air intake there to see if the valve they use has an has any um, involvement with the amount of air pressure that they throw onto the switches because they were using the the air air pressure valve to overcompensate for poor switch systems or poor switch condition. Um, so we're trying to develop sort of a a good setting guide there as well, so that they they didn't over uh, put, apply too much pressure to the switches. So a quick question. I'm going to ask this in the in the um, Q and A later. Um, if anyone knows what this is, um, picture here is a platform. Um, if you can just quickly look at it yourselves and then later on, either in the chat or let me know later on what you think this is, um, because this has problems as well. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so we'll come back to that later. Also did some work on Port Authority Trans Hudson, so I'll give you an idea of, of, of that railway. Constructed in 1907, um, it connects Newark and the New Jersey side through to New Jersey um, and through underneath the Hudson into Manhattan. So it connects up to the World Trade Center and it connects up to 33rd Street and sort of Penn and around there as well. So it's a small railway, there's <clears throat> only um, 140 point machines, 14 route miles. Um, mainly tunnel section and there's uh, open sections there as well on 24 hour running so all, all of these systems have 24 hour running there is no engineering hours there's no um, brief maintenance caps to go in it's all solid 24 hour running the the service pattern does reduce at night time so you do get slightly better access but you still got trains running uh, everywhere <coughs> Uh, here's a few pics from, I think this is Hoboken, um, which was actually produced in the UK when they produced this SNC. So it's SNC produced in the UK, um, shipped out. Uh, you can see there they've got issues with flooding. It's under the Hudson, where you've got a nice example of floating track, uh, and you've got some very complex junctions as well. Some of these were using shallow depth switch designs as well. So. Okay, so. Let's just go into a bit of the, the UK side and um, looking at, I guess, currently what we do within SNC inspection and how we measure whether we determinedly measure this in uh, a static condition or whether we do it in a dynamic condition. So I've what I've done, I've tabled, um, I've tabled this. This is also this was um, in one of the, um, I think it was 2020. It was one of the journals for SSC um, that, that I did a while back, so it can be referred to. Um, and it's looking at how how we measure currently and how we may want to measure if we think that it's, it's more reliable, repeatable, and, and a, a better way 
or it's or it's obtained sort of a safer um, dimension. So so in terms of gauge, yes, we do measure it dynamically, and yes, it is dynamic measurement gauge is the best way to measure it. Um, when we look at flange way, do we want to measure flange way dynamically? I would say no, because the flange way itself has been forced by the train to move in a certain way, so we need to measure it statically. And we need to see what the train is going to see before it hits it. Um, if we did measure it dynamically, we're good to see the difference between the two, and then we can see the, 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 the difference and, and see how much dynamic movement there is. Um, so the text on the right, I won't go for it all, but it explains um, why that reasoning is there and why we measure it in, the, in that sense. So going through to residual switch openings as well, we don't measure that dynamically at the moment, um, but we do statically. We probably don't measure it enough. We do it in certain areas that are fixed with, with stretcher bars or, or, or other areas. But um, to do that dynamically, it would be closed because the switch would be closed against the stock rail. So it's just not possible. Slide plates to slide rail gaps. Um, yep, we would need to do that beforehand because we need to know need to do that statically because we need to know if that does close down when the trains go on there. So this is really looking at, you know, if we were to do dynamic inspections using um, a train born system, could we, what, what we still need to do um, statically via other inspections um, that we don't do dynamically. So it's, it's looking at sort of gap analysis really. Um, and that's that's the main the main reason for that, for that, for those tables. So part of part of our work we did for Intertrack 2 was looking at um, drone surveys for SNC. Some of you guys may have seen this. We did present this at TA and, and I think I presented this to the, um, I think it's to the Sheffield section. No, the Nottingham section, sorry. Um, so the idea of the drill inspections, the drone inspections was to look at the basic visual inspection techniques we could adopt with a drone. Can we do BVI with a drone? Can we do a detailed supervisory inspection of the SSC with a drone? And also we we're looking at the layout prefabrication, so measuring an inspection in the SSC in the layout yard. And we had a brief little look at 053, 054 just to see what if there's any opportunities there. So we did trials in, in the yard with uh, VAE and also at Mantle Lane um, the SNC, and that's the photo there, there of the SNC at Mantle Lane. Um, we did do, develop some pass fail criteria, and that's really making sure it's better than what we currently do. Um, and if there's an improvement there, you know, it's looking at how we can then um, adopt that. So we, we used the standard test forms for measuring. Um, we did some sort of toe and nose measurements of the prefab. And this is just an example of, you know, if a drone is trying to measure <coughs> a toe to nose dimension, for example, like we do prefabs, how's it going to do it? Because it, it physically can't see the nose. It's a, it's a ramp. There is a little line to the side. In some cases, there's a, a weld mark to the nose that tells you where the nose is. And on the switches, you've got a very small upstand that is the toe of the switch. And you know, a lot of the times we use the actual the actual front piece on the foot extension, you know, to measure the 165 mil away. So so it's it's teaching it how to do that. And in some cases, you may need to do that. We can target it or, or we can put something on there where it can measure consistently, then then we know we'll get some consistent information. So for the drone to work accurately, we need to set up a, a survey control that was set up on the SNC in the yard. Um, drones were then flown over. We, we used two different types of drones, different heights, um, and we looked at different ground sampling distances as well, which is sort of how big the pixel is and how much accuracy we can get in the millimetres. Um, so bottom right hand side there, we measured using the total stations, the total nodes, and we got 1.5 mil difference using the point cloud measurements from the from the drone, and the nose to nose was 2.8, and that's more about the accuracy of where the nose is in relation, you know, because we don't have a repeatable method, I think, for measuring noses. It's, it's placing a tape over a ramp piece of steel, um, so. You know, yeah, I think that accuracy is good enough for us, bearing in mind that the accuracy is sort of 25 millimetres for a toe to nose dimension anyway, so we, we know we've met that. Also use some of the video, or, or should I say orthographic um, still images, which, which are then stitched together to, to look at some sort of digital twin 
3D images, see how we can construct a digital twin from this at the prefab um, layout. So then the image can be manipulated with an turn it. So you can go into there and do all other inspections afterwards. So you could take full drone footage, then go back and do all your measurements afterwards. So you don't have to spend all that time in the yard. So um, and there's a sample there of the image being viewed on, on the portal. So that's the images you see on the portal. So it's quite, quite lifelike. So taking all of these measurements, we then did a, a comparison against the sort of gauge measurements that we would do for, for gauging at stretcher bars and gauging at the, at the, the fronts of the switches and so on and the flange ways. Um, so we compared what we measured with a standard gauge and we measured with the top stations and what we measured with the drone. I think the worst case we got, I think, was this four mil, um, and that's on A2, which is the second stretcher bar. Um, so there's a slight element of, of the switch gauge corner profile affecting the gauge measurement, where you would normally use a gauge that's set at 40, 40 mil that drops down. We applied the algorithm there for that, but it still wasn't accurate. So the accuracy wasn't there, but in all of the areas, it was all within two millimetres. Um, so we're quite happy with that. And uh, we, we did have to do, develop a, an algorithm for the cant and the gauge um, to make sure we, we get consistent um, data, and consistent gauge readings um, to take away the noise, to take away what could be an image that it's trying to measure, that, that could be sort of serving view. Mm -hmm. Um, so eventually we got the gauge down to 1.5 mil, um, so compared to sort of manual gauge readings across the whole of the SNC. Also did some pattern recognition work using drones, um, so we applied this afterwards to the footage taken from um, Colville sidings. Um, so uh, the company Pictera produced a sort of a detection model system. So they first of all, they train the area to teach what we want to look for, um, and then they tested it to see that that was trained. Um, they then run the detection system over the imagery, um, and it sort of points out the areas that are missing. So in this instance, we looked at clips, bolts, uh, and this also produced something for the bearers. We looked at the bearers to see, well, can we see if the bearers are cracked or can we put a level over the bearer to see if there's indentations that show anything else? Um, could be a lump of ballast on it or, or a crack in it. So um, can it tell us anything from that? Um, uh, and then we did this comparison. So a comparison was done between the March survey with the drone and the September survey with the drone. Um, I'm going to now try and go onto this. I'll show you. I'll quickly stop presenting. Just going to go on to another screen a minute. Here we go. OK, can you see that all right, Ian? Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, so this is the, the S&C sort of high up in the sky. Um, all those little um, symbols means there's problems and we need to go in and have a look what they are. So on the left hand side, so the green line is a slider bar. Let's see if I can get in there. So on the left hand side is the March, uh, so February, March um, data. On the right hand side is the September data. Um, so we can scroll down the SNC and see the difference. So when I slide over um, on the left hand side to the right hand side, it shows me the difference between the two. Now, I'll try and zoom in on one of these problems. So there is a problem there. Let's zoom in on that. There we go. OK, so what it's highlighted there, if you see on the left hand side, the clip is half. Well, it's not fully inserted, but when I go over there, it's been inserted. That means someone's done their job. <laughs> it's actually been pushed back in. So, so it, it, it acts both ways. So the, the, in, in February, the clip was out. In September, the clip was in. So that's a good thing. Um, so it's showing a clip has moved. It'll also show, if I go up here. Oh, now I'm rotating it. That's a strange one. Um, let's see this one here. So on the left-hand side here, 
we've got a clip that's broken. Um, so the clip is broken and it's missing from that section there, but you can see there it's been fixed. So actually on the left hand side, it was previously OK in, in February and then it came out in September and broke. So so it's it's the accuracy there. I'll show you another another view that will give you an idea about what other things we can do with this. Let's just zoom out. I'm going to go into the switch area. See the stretcher bars come up. So that's full zoom. Okay. Now here is the stretcher bar, the front stretcher bar. So if I had the flats on that marked with a white line mark, um, I would be able to tell if those bars moved. To me, they look like they're slightly moved, but that just could be a shadow. I'd need, I'd need a line to reference it to. So, so if we had reference systems like we do for PLPR, we have reference systems for nuts and bolts, we could actually see whether that's moved. Um, same with the tip. So I could go to the tip, toe just there, not much of a movement, but maybe a mill or two. But you know, we, we, we'd be able to go in and analyze that if we to see if the switch tip has moved as well. So, so yeah, that's, that gives you an idea of, of what drones can do in terms of the accuracy um, that we have, uh, and you know, how can we apply that in the future for you know for for S and C. The only problem I see with with automating uh, basic visual inspection or, or any other inspection of SNCs is really what do we do as a human? Um, what do we do as tactile, as a visual or as, a, as an audible um, when we go out to site? So, you know, under tactile, we, we, we kick and we kick loose bolts or kick bolts to see if they're loose. Um, we have to remove dirt on some hidden areas that might hide a defect underneath. Uh, grease buildup as well, uh, grease covering defects. We stamp on bearers, um, we touch surfaces for roughness. So we do a lot of this stuff, you know, because we, we understand and that's 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 how we, we can tell if there is a problem or not. Um, from visual accuracy, um, you know, we have the ability to see a hairline crack because that's what our, our vision can show us. Um, but we do all the other visual checks on top and line we do and the things that the we do compute in our brains that, that, that you know, we need to teach um, other systems to do. Um, so things like bearer squareness, you know, are they the correct parts? Are the parts assembled the right way? Um, is there anything missing? Yep, we could probably do that under pattern recognition and we do that already. Are the switches hogged? Um, are there any clashing parts that could force for could cause a, a switch failure? Um, are there flange back contact marks? So, you know, it's it's understanding those issues and, and then we have some telltale signs. So, you know, and what could could be a root cause? We, we in some cases we do our own fault combination root analysis. We look at different faults and we combine them. It's not just from one fault. There's there's multiple faults there that are causing this to, to fail, and there's repeatable faults. Um, and we see the sort of ballast formation conditions. We we understand the drainage conditions, the earthwork conditions, uh, and so on. And and one thing I think that's that's also quite I think been quite recent where we've had some issues with dynamic inspections as well it's observing the track under load um, observing ssc under load so we can see trains pass over it how it deflects how it moves um, currently we don't really have a way of doing that with our dynamic inspection systems and our mobile inspection systems um, observing point movement so seeing the points actually move so showing them throwing from normal to reverse and how the switch is moving how the rods are moving how everything you know, clicks into place. And then there's the listening. So we do a lot of listening. We listen to water defects. We might listen to how a crossing uh, is being, you know, when trains pass over crossings or, or, or other things as well. So so it's, it's, it's really understanding those things and, and how how do we capture those in, in future automated inspections? Because if, if we're not careful, you know, a full automated system could start to leave some of these things behind. Um, so this really forms into, you know, what I'd call it the, the start of a digital twin. So um, looking at how we inspected right at the very start on the bottom left, um, we looked at how we can inspect some S&C um, from the start by, by using the drones or by using another scanning method that produced a 3D model of the, of the, of the turnouts. 
Um, so that's got all the switching crossing, but we, we also had all the parts there. We also had um, all the point machines. So it's all there, all in one go. Um, and that's how the sort of digital twin should be originated. And then it's um, looking at the SNC systems, uh, owner manuals, uh, the videos that may go through it, the tasks, the spares, the tooling, the training, and the competency required for for each part of, of that maintenance as well. So, what the minimum competency requirements that you that you need. So, this is where you're starting to sort of build build up your your model. Um, then you're looking at signal and track failure data. So, we're tying in the failure data once it's been installed, um, and then um, We'll be able to look at the maintenance history of all the work undertaken. Again, parts of this are all happening at the moment. You know, we've got parts of this twin happening, but not the full connection, not the full twin, you know, being developed. But but we're certainly progressing in a lot of these areas. Uh, degradation model that will allow us to sort of predict the frequency of when we should be grinding, welding, tamping, you know, adjusting SNC, adjusting the POE. Um, you know, and then it can also predict the, the residual life for a lot of those those items as well. And through asset condition monitoring data, so it's on the point machine, the point heating, void meters that may be on the site, any other sensors that we install that are all, all sort of combined diagnostically to, to give us that, that over, overview of, of what the SNC is doing as well. And then it's it's so any any I'd say remote condition or condition monitoring or, or static monitoring devices, comparing that against the dynamic measurement systems that we have from trains and PLPR and other dynamic means of measurement. Um, and there may be some other things we do from, from AIVR or LIDAR or from, from other geographical or topological data that we could use to, to, to tie into that as well. Certainly with, with earthworks, where earthworks may affect the, the SNC as well. Um, and is there still a reliance on static gauge measurement? Is there anything we still need to do? Do we still need to do a manual or semi-automatic inspection? You know, do do we still need do we need the drone or or like Felix you know, to to measure for us where where everything else you know just can't um, and then looking at it in terms of, sort of verifying it you know against the dynamic measurements and making sure. They all align, and there's there's no problems sort of seen. So we're the future UK practice for whole life SNC inspections. I see it start starting at pre-installation, developing the 3D model, um, developing the manuals. Uh, the asset management regime is very keen, very 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 um, important to do, and, and needs to be uploaded as soon as the asset goes into place. So that could be maintenance scheduled maintenance tasks that are derived from the configuration of the SNC. A parts catalog, um, so we know everything that's on that 1 to 50 O&M, uh, 1 to 50 drawing. Um, and then the 1 to 200 general arrangement, so that's, that's the sort of the file that you would hand back to the maintainer um, once installed. But under installation, we should be verifying all of that. We should be scanning the SNC and comparing it against what it was before. We should have those standardized installation and maintenance tasks ready. Um, have a BIM model that we can then hand over with all the data from the pre-installation and all the other data packs that we currently do um, that, that are handed between suppliers and installers and maintainers. Um, uh, and that digital twin is then handed to the maintainer and available to access via the asset register. And then for future maintenance, we can do our full condition monitoring. Uh, we can use, we can apply the pattern recognition um, against the digital twin, so we can actually overlay digital twins in, on PLPR to show specific um, uh, items that may be specific to that SNC. Um, and then uh, dynamic autonomous geometry and rail profile inspection. So we, we do uh, geometry at the moment, um, applying the sort of rail profile inspections as well. So we can do uh, sort of the 053, 054 type arrangements as well, um, dynamically. Um, and uh, mobile track behavior monitoring as well. So we can apply that to to track where we want to do, I guess, what, what would be the dynamic assessment. Uh, and we either have that permanently fitted to problem sites or we move it around on sites that require that because of um, because of reliability issues and so on. So that could be Go GoPro cameras that, that pick up on things or any other um, track fix asset um, or sensors, uh, uh, digital void meters and so on. That, give us that and then finally really it's it's tying in with with 
certainly with earthworks and drainage, because we know there's risks associated with earthworks and drainage that SSC is faced with. Um, and how do we tie in any monitoring that they do within our model as well, so that we can you know, see the full picture. And that is it. Um, yeah, so um, I think I managed to do that in 45 minutes, just. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so Very yeah, good. over to all of you guys. I'll try and put my camera on now as well. No worries. Thanks, Darren. I think um, I think we've got um, Brian, I think, has, uh, has, has answered the the question. He's got a lot of thumbs up. I don't know if, uh, if it's a true to answer or not, but there was a couple of them were long, a long timber was the question, a gap filler. And then Brian's come out with uh, something around to meet the train on 14th Street, Union Square. Is he uh, right? Brian would know the answer, wouldn't he? Typical, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, Typical it's, Brian. It's called a gap. <laughs> right up, it's it's called a gap filler. So, Barney, yes, uh, you're aware of gap fillers, um, and we had to look into why they're failing because they're basically three point machines linked together that throw uh, a platform out. When the train comes through and it's at its resting point, it can then project the platform to the train, so there's no gap. Um, but they're having all sorts of failures, so we were looking at those sort of common failures. But yeah, yeah, well done. I'm glad some people have seen that before. <laughs> I was told they were going to move it or remove them about, I'm going back 25 years or some 20 years. They're, they're old. I thought yeah, they, they would have been yeah, gone yeah. by now. I have to go back and have another look now. They're still there. They're still there <laughs> collecting dust. Yeah. It was failing yeah. 22 years ago or something, and they were going yeah. to get rid of them to try and improve it. But, they, yeah, I think they, they built new rolling stock and the doors were in the middle not at the yeah. ends, and they had big gaps on the curved platform. But, yeah, I thought they That's would right. have been long gone by now. They they also have rubber strips as well, Brian, on some areas. Yeah. So they have yeah. a rubber protective strip just to fill that gap. Yeah. And those ones had brushes on as well. So that, And they were like a comb arrangement that, 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 yeah, that comes out. Yeah, the finger thing has come out. Yeah. The finger, yeah. No, I, yeah. I didn't realise they still had the p sort of POE in the platform and the bits where you couldn't walk on it. Because yeah, it, it moved when the train pulled in. It did, yeah. You you lift the lid and you see the the machine that actually operates it underneath. Yeah, yeah. And they were having issues with with the seals and the um, cylinders as well, um, because they've just been perished and the, there hasn't been. There's been a lack of maintenance sort of schedule. Mm. And so yeah, yeah. They were, well, if it's any consolation, they were pretty unreliable in two thousand. Oh no, nineteen ninety nine. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> they've done yeah. well to last <laughs> another twenty plus years. Yeah. That's right, yeah. And at 14th Street is the signal training school as well. So there's a signal training school where we worked quite a lot and did a lot of the training where all the old layouts are. And it's 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 a bit like stepping back in time when you go in there and you can see the old point machines and and um but a brilliant facility and, and really well the guys that manage it are really are really good and very welcoming because we we were holding training sessions there and um and reliability and track circuit tra training sessions as well and and they were really, yeah, really good, really responsive. Cheers, Brian. Um, so Andrew uh, Starr's got the first question. Hello, Darren. Um, Hi, Andrew. How are you doing? Very well indeed. Nice to see you again. And good, I was you gonna too. Ask you, I was going to ask you about the um, artificial intelligence uh, applications, where uh, it's clear that if you've got common failures, then you've got plenty of data for training. But we know that we're dealing with some quite reliable systems, so there's going to be some outliers and very rare instances. And I wonder, um, how do you think um, future systems are going to cope with these rare failures and, uh, and outliers? Mm. Well, that's the, a similar problem is with PLPR or applying a PLPR to a railway that has very new technology or very, I'd say, common technology, common track form types, common clips, common, and then it comes to something that is just a bespoke or legacy item that it's like, ah, did we actually program it to to learn on that that type? So I it's it's about population really. It's about understanding the risk level and the population of those assets. And if those uh, population is very low, it's a five percent, it's a case of do we use this system for that? Or is that is that old system actually not you can't transfer it into an AI world or PLPR world, mm. or we don't have the data 
to to understand it. You know, exactly, there's yeah. there's maintenance items out there. There's there's obscure mi- machines and brackets and stuff that that we we have to go out and almost pretty much do a digital scan of drawings, and then we have to replace it with that that part from the digital scan you know drawing version because we don't have it. So I think obsolescence in really old designs is going to capture us out. But we need to be we need to have a railway that is consistent it has the same types of materials or, or component tree and then it's easy to, to do ai apply ai apply digital twin now if we have too many variants we introduce too many other um offshoots into like you say um those maintenance tasks or or or, or other items so we've got to keep it consistent that's the in, thing in a similar context do you think the industry is ready to move away in, uh, into and broad, broadly AI is going to t- make a statistical approach in, in some way as, a po- as opposed to a rule-based approach. Do you think we're ready for that? Um, I don't think we are. We're going to have to develop digital standards. <laughs> okay, our, our standards at the moment are visual and data. The data that's driven is numbers. Okay, we're going to have to at some point Take and this is this has been discussed in in other in other forums where where we're now dealing with digital information, which we're applying a different mindset, a different thought, a different risk profile to, that has to be reassessed from the start. Um, what we're in this transition at the moment where we've got old versus new, we're learning with the new, but we we're still using historical failures and risk and so on because that's what we know as the 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 benchmark to assess against. Um, but as we go into new technology like AI, we'd have to look at it and say, OK, what's it telling the person to do? Is it safely telling them and is it telling the right person? Because it could be telling someone what to do and they're not actually competent to know or understand it. <laughs> so yeah. there's, there's lots of things like that that we've got to understand. And, and I think the way people think nowadays compared to how they used to 30 years ago, you know, how thought processes go through, how many people... I'd say that we're born in the last 20 years would rely on information coming through via a media source or, you know, like such as video or something rather than just written words in a standard. They need to see it and feel it and understand it rather than that. There just isn't the time to read through 20 pages of an O&M manual, for example. You know, so Mm -hmm. they want data fast and quick and and they, you know, the um, I guess the, um, the level of of, you know, of time needed to do it is, is can be a problem but we're going to have to it's a massive shift change really um and people are looking at ai and how we can apply ai but we're going to have to do that to very standard componentry and, and and equipment but we could you know go through the point machines go through the switch types go for the crossing types start there start with a high population um and then we know like you say the outliers will just have to be we may be inspecting the outliers but not the new stuff in the future um until and the outliers also end up being of a poorer condition because they're older they have failure modes that are still there that we haven't corrected because we haven't done any legacy design improvements to them um so they will be the ones we need to concentrate on because that's what catches you out now on london underground we have a similar thing with bullhead switches and bullhead crossings we were we were quite safe and confident with flat bomb uh flat bomb s and c concrete s and c shallow depth s and c but when it came to the bullhead ones that's where you know our inspection regime which was which was a risk-based assess we you know we have been every four weeks whereas the other ones we would inspect every eight or four or 13 weeks you know and that's down to you know legacy designs old configuration old um you know um old spec really yeah does that answer your question <laughs> uh, very fully thank you Yes, Andrew. Next question from Brian. Yeah, sorry for jumping in early, Darren. Thank you for the presentation. Always interested to see sort of what happens elsewhere. I'm interested in your thoughts about or struggles with automating BVI and something Mm -hmm. I've I've had quite a good look at and sort of concerned about. A lot of what we do in BVI is looking for symptoms rather than the cause of them. So hairline cracks. Certainly from looking at some technology recently with the right lighting, the AI is pretty effective. It's it doesn't miss much, but it it did mm. does come down to lighting. But then you're looking at what we, conditions are we doing BVI under 
Yeah. And, and are we really giving them a chance? Because just like cameras, if you go looking in the half gloom at things, you don't see the detail. You might think you've yeah. seen it, but you won't see it if you're looking, yeah, to, to find high airline cracks. So I think there's some stuff in there and a bit of work I've been doing with defects in AI. The AI came up with a new defect that had previously yeah. been discounted by the humans as we're not worried about those and they don't count. Uh, yeah, no, not wrong. Yeah. But it took a, 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 a sort of analytical approach rather than subjective approach and some quite interesting results out of it from that point of view. So, mm. yeah, some, something we'd not consider as a defect, but a precursor to something we would classify as a defect. So back yeah. to sort of symptoms rather than treating the or treating the cause or finding the cause of it as much as anything. But certainly with S and C, you look at our incidents. A lot of them have got precursor conditions that have led to yep. detached stretcher bars, broken fixings, fastenings, that side of things. We're looking yeah. for the end yeah. result rather than perhaps in some cases we might be better looking for the cause. Yeah, and in, in terms of reliability inspections, so, you know, a lot of what we're doing there is is maintaining a safe railway. So we're maintaining it to a, a safe level of, of operation. Um, but with reliability inspections, we're looking for those precursors. Mm -hmm. We're looking for that's going to turn into a track fault. It's going to turn into a signal fault. So we also did some work with track circuits and we were we were, we were telling people at we, how to manage an IRJ, how to support the IRJ, how to make sure you don't have tracking and, and so on. And it, you know, it sort of became apparent that um, lots of the art of what people used to do have gone on how they used to maintain things. Um, and they also had some, they had UTU, they had TRV, so they got sim similar stuff to us, but I'd say older equipment. So that they've got um, track recording vehicles and um, ultrasonics as well. But they don't overlay TRV with the rail defects and they didn't overlay JSIs, the joint switch inspections. You know, so if you had to take all of those and put them together, we, we went to one site and we, we we basically pulled all of those together and looked at them and said, this is the reason why you've got a problem here. You've got three different combination defects happening. They're probably not reportable because they're low, but these are things that PLPR or, or we can teach the digital twin to do it. It pulls in all of those figures and it can say, although it's not a, a level one, level two or a high level exceedance, it's low level there. It's low level in rail defect, low level in, in terms of TRV or, or track geometry exceedance, low level. But those three low levels make a high level, you know. So and, and you know, do we do that in our standards at the moment? Probably not because we're chasing those high level exceedances and stuff. But but in doing that, we can look at the precursors and we can start to then trend all those what would lead to a problem. So so you're right. We, 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 we've we got to do that prediction side rather than looking for something that's already failed. Um, yeah. So we should have a, a safety function that does that. This is something that's broken and we should have a reliability function. And if PLPR could be used for reliability, in you know by looking at those those finer conditions it's almost like the filter needs to be even finer for that you know to get that then for s and c we, we just pick the areas that which we know are, 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 are common problems but look at that and you inspection train to 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 filter that then we've got a better better idea of, of getting you know getting some good results and, and getting there before the failure happens yeah no fascinating yeah. thank you it's an interesting one, yeah. yeah thanks, Brian. Um, so we've got one question on the chat. It's just about how how extensive does the control setup need to be for the drone surveys? Um, so the control setup is the same as what you would use for any um, sort of uh, tail stations, you know, EDM type arrangement. So you put the targets down. Um, so for an SNC, for that particular SNC, it was 150 meters long. We per targets every 50 meters on both roads. So um, that's quite an accurate control system. So if you went to each site, I would say each SNC probably needs about three control points. Um, so that it's got that full triangulation. So it's all about triangulating it, up, you know. And once we know, obviously, then that can be overlaid onto a grid or or whoever it could be. But but in terms of, and it, it is about establishing a, an accurate 
ground control and that's what we rely on for that you know because then we can go back out use that ground control do the overlay um you know if if we had the ground control on a bearer and that bearer moved then when i showed you that sliding ruler you know it's yeah the answer could be well how do i know the ground control hasn't moved you know um there are there are other things that we can fix assets on and and, and you know control it to as well but but that's it's it's quite an important part and that's more often than not that's you know to mobilize drones that's the sort of big cost is having that that ground control in place um to do that or you know there are there are people using drones to do bvi but they're not measuring so you know ground control is really to get that measurement but if you just want it to be your eyes then do you need the ground control on a lot of sites they don't so um uh, or if you're just doing a BVI, but you want to do those comparison checks, but not have accurate measurements, there may be a an easier, quick win ground control system that you could apply that that gives you sort of basic BVI, but not, you know, because we were doing this sort of detailed supervisory inspections, looking at gauge and flangeways and joint rail joint gaps as well and things like that. So, um, yeah, so it's um, ground control is quite important. Brilliant. Thank you, Darren. A really good presentation. I think that brings us to the end of the Q Q and A. Um, go, going through, particularly the uh, New York bit, it was like learning a new language again for me with all the different <laughs> all the different things. A house stop, never knew where that was. Um, good to see that other people have tried it. But within the the use of cant was another. You know, putting some wood on there that looked like some Heath Robinson yeah. thing. I've seen it at rugby one time. Um, and um, uh, you know, baskets to catch bolts was was amazing. You know things like them not understanding residual switch opening um or the yeah. importance of it etc was just just great to see and the, the stuff you've done on root cause analysis that looks that looks really amazing i think it was quite funny the way the joint joint s and c form still didn't get them to work together so you nice. know that's, that's <laughs> whatever you do it still doesn't happen um yeah. and then, yeah trying to do all of that and maintain everything you know you could see there's so much grease and build up with a 24-hour railway were just incredible you know were, were they managing that red zone were they effectively or were they yeah yeah so yeah. all, all wow. our inspections were red zone um we were elevated sections we we're doing inspections in between trains as well um incredible. yeah all red zone yeah. incredible and then that stuff you showed about the 3d imaging and the way that's going you know i'd seen some stuff about drones previously but nothing like that so um you know really really good rate um uh, uh presentation thank you very much and if everybody could join me yeah. thanking um darren in the usual manner that'd be great thank Bye, you okay. thank you <laughs> brilliant thanks very much um and I think our next meeting is the AGM, so uh, we'll we'll see you soon. Cheers, Brilliant. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye, Arthur. <laughs>